Thank you, Ramaji, and namaste to all. It is wonderful to be here after I didn't realize 65 months of Bharatiya Vicharmanj activity. And good to see all of you, many of us the Karikarta as well as great well wishers of Sangha. So I think most of the things that I'll say may not be very new to all of you, but it will be good to see it in pictures. Because most of the presentation is nothing but pictures so that you get a uh, you get a feeling of being there. As Ramaji said, that Sangha activities are happening worldwide in all the continents, and starting from New Zealand to the east to Canada in the west, that is the span between east and west, and uh, almost 39 countries now. Shakas are there. So, just before that, uh, I would like to speak about the Hindu diaspora. Long ago, people or the scholars used to speak about Jewish diaspora, Japanese and Chinese diaspora, but now there is a lot of discussion about Hindu diaspora as well. And although all of you have come here to, uh, to hear mostly, and most of you are out of high school and college a long, long time, I'm sure you would love to have a little quiz <laughs> or change. And, uh, Nepal. Nepal, right? Not, not Bharat. <coughs> Nepal is most in the percentage wise. Name any five countries that have two million or more Hindus. US. US. UK. Sorry, UK. 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 UK now. New Zealand. Nepal, Bangladesh. Nepal, Bangladesh. Canada. Canada. Nepal, <laughs> Bangladesh. Okay. Bangladesh, okay. Bangladesh has uh, 1.4 crores, you know, 14 million. Fiji. India. Yeah, Pakistan has. Pakistan has 25, 2.5 million. And Malaysia. Malaysia has 2 million. Sri Lanka, of course. Sri Lanka is there. Sorry? Mauritius. No, Mauritius. Those countries are coming up. Fiji? 25% or more of those. They may not be millions, but the percentage there will be more. So any countries now? Fiji, Fiji, Suriname, yes. Fuji, Suriname Guyana, yeah, yeah, Trinidad, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mauritius, yeah. Mauritius we spoke, right? So like that, so we can see that some countries the percentage is high, some countries the numbers are big. In Bangladesh, uh, some 9% Hindus, but 1.4 crores, so that's 14 million Hindus are there. Pakistan also, uh, 2.5 million Hindus, which is just 1% of the total population, something like that. So just to get a idea, so Hindu population in countries other than Bharat, top 10. So Nepal, Bangladesh, Indonesia, oh we forgot about Indonesia, the reason being? Bali. Bali. Bali itself has 6 million Hindus, 90% uh, Hindu population there. So that is the only province which has so many Hindus, but yes, big numbers. There are of course all these places. So the diaspora, was formed in three different waves, we can say. And the first one is called the classical wave, which was 1500 years ago or more, which happened mostly to from Central Asia to Southeast Asia. So all the countries, especially in the Southeast Asian region, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, all these countries. And even now, you can see the influence. Then the first wave of migration, after a long gap of almost four to five hundred years, most of it self-imposed because of the attacks and the invasions. We became very insular and we stopped going outside. And it, it was called a Sindhu Bandi. Means if you cross the ocean, then you lose your dharma. That was the belief. And that's because of the Sindhu Bandi, we stopped going. So the diaspora kind of had uh, shrunk, you can say. But then because of the advent of the British, the British Raj, because they were recruiting and taking people outside of Bharat, again it restarted. So mainly to African countries for trade, which continued for uh, always, but they also went as teachers and other professionals, and then a large number in the Girmitya countries. Girmitya countries, meaning the countries like Mauritius, Fiji, and so on, where they had to sign an agreement, five-year agreement. And because those who signed the agreement, 
they were called agrementias. Agrementia, just in Bhojpuri, we both there. So they will say agrementia. So that became Girmitia. So now those countries are called as Girmitia countries. And then the second wave, of which all of us are part, is the migration to the Western countries as well as West Asia, but the Gulf countries. And even Australia, New Zealand. So the current migration that is happening is again populating different countries and the Hindu diaspora is growing. Why this background is just to understand how Sangha also went outside. Because RSS was started to unite, organize Hindus in Bharat to make Bharat a very strong, vibrant nation, Paravayabhavashali nation. But then the question will be why outside of Bharat? Because Hindu society is spread in almost 100 countries in different degrees. So the need for Hindu Sangatan is there even outside. And that's how Swayam Sevaks who were trained in RSS, when they started going outside, naturally they thought that you know we cannot do anything there, now we are here, so let's start something. And that is how the Hindu Swayam Sevaks Sangha originated. The first one happened in Kenya and then it kept growing in Myanmar, then UK and so on. So just look at how the diaspora looks. These are some of the pictures from the classical wave of Hindu migration in Southeast Asia. The Ganesh is from Thailand in the World Trade Center of Thailand. This picture of uh, Krishna and Arjuna is from anybody? Bali. Uh, no. India. Close. Indonesia, Indonesia. Jakarta. <laughs> Jakarta. And then of course Angkor Wat, all of us know the Ramayana paintings, you know. Uh, many of you may have seen the Samudra Mantra also at the Thailand airport. <coughs> Rama and dance in, in Bali, uh, pictures from Bali especially. Then there were the first wave of migration, the Girmitya countries. Even now the traditions are there, the Ganga puja happens, there's the temple in the sea in Shirda, and then they do this puja, and that picture in the, the bottom uh, left corner is of a teenager who turned 16, so he turned a Rama and Satsang. So something different. Somebody turns 16 and they host a Ramayana satsang at home. So those traditions are still continuing in these countries which are the Girmitya countries. So Holi, Diwali, all these such things happen. And of course we are all part of this one, this phenomenon that is happening, that the newest expansion of our diaspora. Anyway, so Hindus worldwide we should appreciate that they live in different kinds of environments, different kinds of countries. And that's how their situation is different. We here in America, we live in a very democratic, liberal country, Western democracy. But there are Hindus living in different types of countries. And that's why they have certain limitations we need to understand. So Western democracies is pretty easy. All uh, European countries and Canada and you know, US and all those countries. Freedom of expression is there, freedom of religion is there. We are pretty much open to do anything which is falls under within the legal framework. Then the Gilmitia countries where our people can even become presidents and prime ministers and they have become in many countries. <coughs> All these countries have included some African countries as well. So here also there is a lot of freedom, no problems. But many times, a lot of political tussle because we are in big numbers and sometimes we are at the receiving end. In most of these countries, because we have not gone into law enforcement, into the military, we have suffered. In Fiji, a uh, democratically elected Prime Minister Mahendra Singh Chaudhary, he was ousted by the, the military coup mm. because our people are not there enough, near enough numbers. So those issues are there. A lot of social issues are there because they started as laborers and now they have gone into all kinds of professions but still a lot of social issues remain within the Hindu society in the Indian countries. And then these are the toughest ones. Although our people go there for good prospects and to make some good money and then return, their situation we all know is, is bad. And of course Hindus in Bangladesh and Pakistan uh, they have to be there because they are from those countries and their situation is, is uh, not very good in terms of human rights and religious rights. 
So just the appreciation of the diversity in which Hindus live. Now let's look at the Sangha movement because that's the main topic for today. So I'll run through uh, all the different programs. So the vision of HSS is in the Prathana of HSS about speaks about the global peace and harmony and to take forward the universal message of dharma. And we say that we have started nothing new. We take inspiration from all the age-old principles that are already there in our, in our wisdom traditions. So we take inspiration from there. We have not come up with any new philosophy as such. All we do is we work to create proud and practicing Hindus, the need of the hour. And both are important, to be proud through knowledge and to practice it in day-to-day -day life. So both are, both are important. You know, you cannot be just proud uh, and speak about it in a political sense but not be practicing in day-to-day -day life and vice versa. You cannot be just practicing inside your home but not or feel ashamed when you go outside to talk that you are Hindu. So I think both are important. Then of course to unite and organize the Hindus. Unite meaning creating an overarching Hindu identity. Organizing meaning being responsive to the newer challenges, to the newer needs of the society. That's how we organize and be efficient and effective in responding. And to do the above two, we need selfless workers, karyakartas, and that is what we will focus on creating. So that is the mission of Sangha. And this is done through a simple program called the Shakha. In Bharat, many of you know, it is a daily activity. They come together on a daily basis, do activities for one hour. But outside of Bharat, mostly, 99%, it is all weekly shakhas. So once in a week, and in most of the countries, again, they are family shakhas. Uh, although in some, they still do separate, uh, like, uh, so and so will shakhas. Uh, so it's a time-tested method that now we want to take to other people as well. I will come to that towards the end of the presentation, that something that has worked in the Hindu society to motivate and inspire young and all kinds of people to be selfless and give back to the society. Develop myself so that I can contribute more. So that has happened through Shakha, a technique that has been um, so well known now that we can share it with others as well. So I think uh, just some statistics that for all activities outside of Bharat, the source of inspiration remains the Rashtriya Swamsev of Sangha. Pujani Dhamparaji, who was the founder of Sangha, started in 1925, and Pujani Guruji, who led the organization for 33 long years and gave direction to many other initiatives started by Sangha Swamsevas. Sangha is known for its dis discipline, for its patriotism, and to be there in the need of the society at, in, during any calamity, whether natural or man-made, Sangha Swamsevas are the first ones to reach. Very recently you may have seen on the television, uh, during the Kolkata, the bridge fell down, and even journalists like Rajdeep Sardese had to cover it because it was too obvious what was happening there, or whether it was in Nepal, whether it was in Chennai floods, Uttarakhand floods, Sangha Swamsevas are in the forefront in helping. Current number of shakhas, daily shakhas, is 57,000. Number of saptahit millions, which means weekly activity, is 13,000. And Sangha Mandali, which is a loose uh, uh, team of people doing uh, you know, occasional activity, is 8,000. So we can say some 78,000 units of Sangha are functioning all over Bharat. And the daily attendance is uh, 5 million, correct? 5 million, yes. Uh, 50 lakh, you know? So there is the daily attendance in the Sanghas. And Seva projects number almost 150,000, a little over that, which range from healthcare, education, women empowerment, youth empowerment, environmental care, all kinds of different projects uh, have we started and work by Swamsevas. 
Ramaji was mentioned about Pracharaks who devote full time for the organization. The current number is 2700. In Bharat, outside of Bharat is 19. One time, Pracharaks are there. Again, as I said, that Swamsuks went out from India and then they started Sangha by different names. Although Hindu Swamsuk Sangha is the most popular name, in different countries you will find different names. In Malaysia, it is called Hindu Sevai Sangam, same name is there in Sri Lanka also. Then in Myanmar, it has been called Sanatana Dharma Swam Sevak Sangha. In Singapore, it is Vivekananda Seva Sangha, and so on and so forth. So, depending upon the local situation, different names have been created. The very first one was in Kenya in 1947, and then was in Myanmar in 1950. And then in the UK, 1966. So they are completing 50 years this year. You can see the banner at the bottom. So this is the global picture of Shakas. Uh, it says 38 countries, but you know, one country is sometimes here and there. So you can see pretty much in all the continents, you can see the Shakas. Right. America zone, so just five countries we have Shakas. The latest ones are in Japan, in Italy, and in the western part of Africa, that is Nigeria and Ghana. That's when we have added the new, new shakas. Visits by dignitaries and prominent people in our programs. So this is a picture from the 1960s, where Jomo Kenyatta who was the first president of Kenya. He attended one of our shivis. That's a picture from there. And then Margaret Thatcher, when she was Prime Minister in the UK in 1990, she attended the Makar Sangranti also of a local shaka in Finchley. Finchley was her constituency and she came and her speech is available <coughs> online. So if you get a chance, you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, it speaks about, she speaks about how she is impressed by the, the Hindus in her constituency, that they are law abiding, well educated and uh, most importantly the family values. You say that the British also, we as a nation, we can learn from you about the family values. So she has given a wonderful speech. Then Nelson Mandela, he had, when he was the president actually, he attended the World Hindu Conference in Durban in 1995. It was a big gathering of almost 30,000 Hindus in South Africa. And he attended, he has given also a wonderful speech about the universal acceptance that Hindus can teach the entire world. In our own Tulsi Gabbard from Hawaii, a congresswoman, she attended few of her events. Dharma B was in Chicago two years ago, three years ago. Then she also attended the Dharma and Yoga Fest. And you know, she has been very uh, a close friend of Sangha and always been there for us. Very recently, this year, 2016, and you won't realize that in this picture there is a president of a country. So the person sitting here with the Majira is President Granger, President of Guyana. He invited our Swayam Sivas to sing what they call as Chauta in UP Bihar during uh, Holi time, Phagwa Dekwa. They sing different songs, Holi, Phagke Gani. So it's a tradition. So he invited them to the state house and he's sitting right there with all of them and singing the Holi songs with them. Similarly, somebody who is called the Tiger, right? anybody a cricket fan? So Shivaram Chandrapal, he came and we honored him. As a, as a Hindu, we are proud that he is uh, who he is. And he and with his son, uh, he came and we honored him for being a role model for Hindus. He is a very staunch Hindu. You may remember when he was playing in Kolkata, he went to the Bharat Seva in the Mandir. He took the blessings and then went and scored a century also. <laughs> Raal Khausar, a Olympic medalist in, from Houston, he came to our student was connected. So in various countries, a lot of you know, prominent people, dignitaries, they have graced the events and we also invite them. Now I'll just go through four types of programs that we are doing. 
first kind of programs is samskar giving programs, values giving programs. So I think all of us know that different kinds of camp, camps, the Hindu heritage camps and the youth camps as well as family camps, where the Hindu values, Hindu cultural values as well as moral values. So those are given. And the Balabokulam, not only in the US, we borrowed the name Balabokulam from Kerala. That's where they put it first started. And now, throughout the world, either as Balabokulam or Balabharati, similar activities go on through Sangha. Recently, we had the Vishwa Sangha Shibir in, in Indore, just four months ago. And then there was a meeting of all those rural Balabokulams through Sangha in various countries. And now because of internet, it has been, it is so easy to communicate. Now the idea is that we can pool the resources, we can learn from each other, even online, and have a continuous communication so that we can do our activities better and we can give our kids something of great value. A few years ago we had done this for Kaur Manega Ramayan Expert. In fact, you know, some of your kids may have participated. There was a big hit. Uh, similar program in Kenya called the Hindu Genius. So they have created a syllabus about Hindu culture. Initially they did the program for high schoolers. Then they realized that okay, high schoolers is fine, but if we really have to pass this on to the next generation, maybe we should invite newly married couples. So the next year they did the program for newly married couples. And um, that way, they, if they know, then they will give it to the children also. So it's a big hit, it continues every uh, few years. This, some of you may remember, Swami Vivekananda, 150th birth anniversary. A uh, lot of programs where you know, children participate in competitions and they dressed up like Swami Vivekananda, by heart and the uh, various quotations by Swamiji and so on. That was a wonderful program called Dharma B. And the finals were in Chicago, the children were learning about Swami Vivekananda throughout the year, almost half the year. So they were all thrilled. And the finalists they, who went to Chicago, for them it was a very special moment when we took them to the, the same auditorium and the same stage where Swamiji gave the famous speech, the first speech about Sisters and Brothers of America. And then we took the pictures there. For them it was a very emotional moment. So these are the finalists, some of them. It was 140 of them who went actually. This is the Swami Vivekananda's statue in Lemont Temple in Chicago, if anybody has been there. This is another unique and creative program by a Sangha in Singapore. It is called the IPGF, Indian Traditional Games Festival. So whole day event where Kabaddi, Kho Kho, and then Atya Patya, and then so many different Indian games, Gilly Danda, they play for the whole day. This year, some 1300 people have registered, and it's going to happen very soon. Um, the mainstream media covers this, and uh, there are two things one is competitions and demonstrations. So, demonstrations of games which are not very well known, and competitions of games which are already known. So, that's how. And it is getting more and more popular. So the neighboring country, Thailand, they also decided to do it this year. And they went even beyond that. They introduced some 25 games in the Indian traditional games festival. Something unique, different. So it's through various activities, building some scar, creating pride, and immersing ourselves in the, in the culture. So that is something that we continue to do. Sanchar meaning promoting. How do we promote what we have as values and the universal values how we can promote. So one program that we have done here and now it happens all over the world is called Guru Vandana where we invite the school teachers of the Shakha going children and then we honor them. In the process we achieve both. We achieve that our children should know that teachers are respected in the culture and then the teachers know that in the Hindu culture teachers are respected. You, you may remember in, I think two years ago or even before that, President Obama has continuously mentioned about how Eastern cultures respect teachers. 
and how we Americans can benefit from that kind of value. At least twice in the State of Union address, President Obama has mentioned it. That how, in fact, he mentioned how in the Eastern countries, teachers are treated as gods. Acharya Devo Bhava, and we should also do something like that. So uh, that goes on, and it's always a wonderful experience for the teachers. Many teachers wanting to be invited even for the next year's event. Like that. In Raksha Bandhan, actually, this started in the UK, and now it happens in all countries where we take uh, appointment from the mayor or the police department or the fire department and tie Raki to them as a universal oneness day and maybe universal oneness band. So that is also much appreciated everywhere. Then this also we started in, in Bharat, but then after outside of Bharat in the US, but now many, many countries have picked it up. And Surya Yagya has become part of the character of events in many countries through which we are able to reach out to a lot of yoga enthusiasts and because of which we could do a wonderful job coordinating the first international day of yoga last year where we could bring so many organizations together because we already knew them through SNY. So that is something that is growing. Then some of you may remember the exhibition that we did and we it was a mobile exhibition to explain to people who are curious about what Hindu culture is and what are the dharmic traditions. And it evoked a lot of response in public libraries, in universities, in state capital buildings, we could do. Some other countries have also bought the sets and they do it. The reason is that if we don't tell who we are, others are always going to define. I mean, many of you know and the DCF efforts all of you are aware of that the effort that the knowledge should come from from practitioners. So we have to make proactive efforts. So this is a little effort by Sangha to go out in the public to create awareness. So this exhibition went all over. And just like Bharatiya Vichar much happens here, similar activities happen in the UK, in Hong Kong, and many other countries where they invite speakers from time to time and are in lectures. This one was also a very path making one. Uh, here is Ram Prakash Ji Thir. He is no more. He was a Pracharak all his life. He passed away at the age of 84 and became the became Pracharak at the age of 25. So you can imagine. And he was born in Myanmar, came to went to Bharat for studies, then went back and became Pracharak. And he was a great scholar of both Hindu as well as the Buddhist philosophies. He created this exhibition about it was called the Bauta Pradarshini about Buddhism in Myanmar to take to the people of Myanmar where Buddhism came from, what are the fundamentals and how it has close connections with Hinduism, the Vedic religion. And that created a lot of goodwill and especially in the Southeast Asian region where both Hindus and Buddhist traditions are there. In many countries, the practitioners, they, they mix it. They don't call themselves only Hindu or only Buddhist, which is the way it's supposed to be created a lot of awareness and education about Buddhism and the, the roots, roots of Buddhism. In Kenya, they have successfully created a syllabus for what they call as RE, religious education in schools. In UK, in Australia, New Zealand is called RI, religious instruction. There also literature has been created, but this, these books go in the schools to teach Hinduism in the RE class. So this was an effort by all Karigatas who created a team and they published this. And this one is there, I did not speak much about it. It's, it happened in 2005 and it's again going on. The efforts to correct the misrepresentations in the textbooks that are there. So I think all of you know about this. Then the Sankatan part, Sanchar part I spoke about. Sangatal part, constant effort to unite Hindus, to create a united Hindu front. Hindu Council of Kenya is one of the most successful of these efforts. Hindu Council is an umbrella body of all Hindu organizations in Kenya. So whenever the government of Kenya has to deal with anything Hindu, a 
about Hindu affairs, they will come to Hindu Council. So there's one body all the organizations work through. Similar efforts are there in Tanzania. There is a Hindu Council of Africa, not so effective. And there are many events where we have been able to bring Hindus, forgetting their differences, forgetting their denominations and languages and nationalities to come together in big events. And right here in Cerritos we have done and in, uh, throughout the US, uh, the Dharma and Yoga Fest was done in 30 cities where totally about 45,000 people attended. And youth activities, especially on campuses, even on American campuses, there are all kinds of organizations. But uh, having a Hindu club, our youth standing up there and saying that we are Hindu and this is what it means, we can come together and associate as Hindus and explain to other students who may be interested in Hinduism to come and learn from us, we have to have a presence. So all over the world, various efforts are there, uh, although the efforts are still uh, quite inadequate. We need to do much more to increase our presence on university campuses here in America as well as worldwide. The most successful is in the UK, the National Hindu Students Forum, which has uh, chapters all over the UK and it is, it is the most recognized Hindu youth organization in the United Kingdom. Even in Trinidad and Tobago, the HSCTT has taken up topics of national importance. And so, why should Hindu students take only topics of that related to Hindus? They say we are 30% here, we should take up stands which affect the entire nation, the island nation of Trinidad and Tobago. So, HSCTT will take stand from a Hindu perspective, but for the entire country, like that. This is another effort which needs to be replicated in many places. This has started in Vancouver. Our Manya Sengaj Alak there, uh, he's from Punjab and he has very good connections with the, within the Sikh community as well. So all the moderate Sikhs who are, you know, pro-India like that, and the entire Hindu community. So they have <coughs> started this forum called the Hindu Sikh Forum of North America. They only do three events per year. One event is Vaisakhi, which is the common heritage celebrated together. Second is India's Independence Day, so that we are clear. Right? They are about uh, they are pro-India, they are not the other uh, separatist ones. And then Guru Teg Bahadur Palidal Divas, the day when Guru Teg Bahadur was uh, skilled in Delhi. So in the remembrance of that to highlight the contributions, the, the courageous efforts by the Sikh community to save the Hindu society. So this Sikh, Hindu Sikh forum, now we would like to spread to other places also. Wherever there is the Sikh community is there, how we can build the bridges, we know what the situation is. There is a dire need that we make connections with the moderate groups and the moderate Sikhs are larger in number but less vocal, the extremists are less in number, more vocal. They have their own propaganda, they have been doing that to the next generation. Unless we create a forum which can actually present the facts and what the reality is, we are not going to be able to counter it. So this Hindu Sikh forum is something that we would like to promote everywhere. In New Zealand and Australia, because we are the fastest growing religion, even the politicians, the Prime Minister, they all are interested to attend our programs. You see, because of the percentage, we are larger. In Australia, we are 325,000, but it's almost, I think, 2% of the population. In, in New Zealand, we are only 125,000 Hindus, but we are already almost 2.5% of the population. In pockets, we make a big difference. And taking advantage of that, how we can highlight what Hindus have contributed to these countries. So the national conference is organized to highlight that and every time we make sure that we invite the, the topmost leaders of the country. So then they also know and there is, there is no backlash. Then of course the fourth aspect of SEVA 
and I'll go through a lot of seva activities that I've been doing around. So in Bharat, of course, through RSS and allied organizations, but even outside of Bharat. Now we are also seeing that we are the first ones to reach in many places. Nepal, earthquake happened last year. We were the first ones and unfortunately the only ones on the ground. There was absolutely no presence of any other organization to help people on the ground. So we are not proud about it. I mean, we feel good at least we were there, but many, many more people should have been there. Afterwards, of course, the military reached and others reached. However, largely, all the non-governmental efforts were through Sangha and Seva. The Nepal government has given access to Seva International to send the funds directly to Nepal. Nobody else they have given that access. Seeing our work and seeing see how we have functioned there, they have played an exception for us. Like that, uh, in the US, of course, the Bhutanese Refugee Empowerment Project that is still ongoing, and in Katrina, Hurricane also, our services were involved. The biggest one that is happening currently is in Sri Lanka. In the northern part of Sri Lanka, after the, the civil war was over, the situation was extremely, extremely dire. I met Swami Sarvarupadanji of Ramakrishna Mission in Colombo. He was in tears even after four or five years of that incident. That how he went there after the war and then <coughs> looked at the situation, he looked at maimed people, burned people, and people who have lost everybody in the family, their entire house is destroyed. And he was saying, he was telling me that, you know, I'm a sannyasi. And I go and talk to people about spirituality and God. But there was a moment when a thought came to my mind, is God really there? Does God really exist? This kind of suffering I have seen. So the situation was this, that 80,000 war widows, about 80,000 orphaned children, and large number of young able-bodied men and women who didn't get access to any education because of the war, so now the war is over, but they have no skills. So that's how the situation was, and many people are homeless. Now, gradually, government has worked on it, many NGOs have worked on it, and we are, as Seva International and through Sangha, we are doing a lot of work there, focusing mainly on empowerment, not just handouts. So you can see the, the project. So we are giving agricultural equipment to the farmers. We are giving initial seed money to women to start some home business so they can become self-employed. Or to students to give them scholarships, even bicycles to ride to school, things like that. That will help them become come on their own feet very quickly. That has been the focus in Sri Lanka and the, the work still continues. In Kenya they do a lot of things. One thing they have done unique is taken part in the Kenyan government's efforts to plant trees, reforestation. When we say Africa, Africa is known for its jungle, huh? but a lot of deforestation has taken place. Kenyan government is trying to reforest. And just last year, uh, we completed 100,000, planting 100,000 trees through HSS. Like that, from time to time, different projects have been taken in Kenya. But a special project I will talk about at the end of the day. The newest, the newest uh, shakha is in Japan, not even two years, one and a half years. But they are already engaged in seva activities, they did a blood donation drive and unique activities they are doing. They did a program about Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose and because on that occasion they, they did a blood donation drive. So like that, because Netaji's connection with Japan. This is a young man, I was going to I'm just giving one example that how we would like to work in the local communities. He went to work with the Save the Family Institute in Atlanta. This is run by African Americans who would like to work with Hindus because they want to re-establish family values in their community. So this man, Charles William, who is standing right there, he came to our shakha, our family shakha, and he was so thrilled that you know, children are playing, the adults are doing the activities, teenagers have their thing going on, and all of a sudden the whistle blows, everybody is quiet, 
everybody lights up. Then there is singing, prarthana, and after Shaka, nobody is willing to go home. They are all still playing and eating something. Tears are rolling from his eyes, saying that when can I see this happening in my community? And he has always been wanting to work with us. So this young man, Tushar, he went and spent the entire summer in that community, the African American community, as part of our Yuva for Seva program. And uh, he came and told a lot of stories. That Mother's Day, in the school, they did a competition, essay competition, to write about your mother. So a lot of essays came, a lot of entries came. In June month, Father's Day came. When they opened the competition for writing about father, only six entries came. So he didn't know what's going on, but the teacher was not surprised. Because majority of those kids, they don't know who their father is. They come from single parent and not knowing who their father is. That is the situation in the African American community. That, so we can see the reason why they want to work with us to, to re-establish this. So they are in a kind of a vicious circle because the boys, they have not seen father, so they don't know how to become a father. What is the role? What is the role of a father in the family? So, so it continues, it perpetuates. So how they can break through it. So we'll see how we can continue working with them. And some new initiatives which I will talk about and then I will stop. So these are continuous activities happening. We are working within the Hindu community, you know, building organization, creating swayam servants and karikartas. But countries where we have been working for a lot, now we can or we are in a position to go beyond our community also. And the initiative has been, the first step has been taken by Kenya in a project called Arise Kenya. And our first Vishwamak Sanyojak, Mani Gileji, he was the first Pracharak outside of India. While in Kenya, he used to say that one day we should be able to inspire the local communities, the host communities, to start their own sangha. So just like we have benefited through this method of organizing and creating selfless workers, even they can benefit, they can learn from us. So few of our Karakantas, both Swamsevaks and Sevikas, they have started this project just recently, last year. They have named it Arise Kenya. It has two components. One is running a shaka. So you can call it Kenyan Swamsevaksa, something like that. So we are not going to make them Hindus. But working with them, with their youngsters, to uh, motivate them, just like we do in our own community. So you can see the shaka happening there, and then working with women and others for what they call as ideal village, Adarsha Gram Yojana. How we can conserve water, hygiene, health, education, all these things, employment. So they are going to start taking cue from what all the experiments we have done in Bharat about integral uh, rural development. So this is a very, very new project. Uh, we will you know, put resources, we will assign karikartas who will go and do it. They have started translating many things in Swahili language. Because our karikartas are born and raised there, their first language is Swahili. The second language is Gujarati or Punjabi or whichever. So the Geet, many of us know is Isha Me Deta is much. Now it is available in Swahili as well. So this time we can try to sing it this way. This is another project. Well, it is not called as Columbia Calling, but because Columbia took the initiative to call us, I just named it that. So this young man here, I mean, he's also a young man, but this young man I'm talking about. <laughs> His name is Edwin Lopez. He's from Columbia, 34, 35 years old. He initiated the contact. He called, uh, he wrote an email to the RSS website saying that you know I'm a yogi or a disciple, and I feel that only RSS can fulfill yogi or Bindo's dream of uniting the entire world and creating this super <coughs> world consciousness. So obviously the email came to me. Then I started communicating with the Communication was not easy because he doesn't know English and I don't know Spanish. So he used to bring the interpreter every time and on Skype, 
He will speak, then the interpreter will translate and it continue. So then he invited us that you please come because there are many, many people here who are followers of the Sarada of Dharma in various ways. Some of them are Iskot followers, some other Gaudiya Sampradayas, some of them have become Shaivas, some of them have become followers of Satya Sai Baba and very ardent, true, sincere devotees. So in the first step, he organized and we stayed in many, many different homes. Colombian people, our local, no, nobody from her. And you know, for eight days, they provided us vegetarian food and not one dish was repeated. Right? For all the eight days, breakfast, lunch and dinner, so how many? 24. Every time a different vegetarian dish, not one dish was Indian. So they have come up with their own ways of changing their lifestyles, being a devotee. So this is a young group of people again who are Shaivas. They have a Shaiva ashram there. So a couple of projects that we have started, and many of us know the young Ji. So Dhyan Ji is our Pracharak, and he will be going there every year working with them on a couple of projects. One is Shakha. Those who have become Hindus, we can start Shakha, normal Shakha for them, especially the youngsters. Second is Seva activities. Again, Colombia being uh, affected by the civil war because of FARC, FARC. Now that is getting over, there is a lot of need for Seva activities. Education, health care. So this is one place this thing is not working. So this picture here, there is a place called Garden of Children, run by Sakta Sai devotees, one lady, uh, that lady is not here. So we are going to partner with them to run educational projects for these children. They again come from very disturbed backgrounds, single parent families, they are all displaced from their places and they are lives in slums in near Bogota. So that's where we will work. And the third project is with the native traditions. You can see the picture here. Is a native elder, native Muiska elder. And this young lady here, her name is Priscilla. Some of you may have met him in Sakash Kishawar last year. She is now a full timer of International Center for Cultural Studies. And she has contacted so many elders of the ancient traditions, their native traditions. And we will be supporting that also. So this is the newest initiative of our experiment in Colombia, Latin America. Once we get some experience there, then we would like to go to other countries. There also a lot of interest is there in Argentina, in Peru, in Spanish-speaking countries. So that obviously will be supported from the United States. Just like Kenya is taking up projects in Kenya, this one will have to be uh, supported from here. We have to all learn Spanish, go there and give both things in Spanish one day. So, we will stop here.